Today I have with me Dr. Sally Gorner. Dr. Gorner is the director and co-founder of the Integral Science Institute, a nonprofit research and educational center with advanced degrees and professional experience in computer science, engineering, nonlinear dynamics, and psychology. Dr. Gorner's specialty is showing how a range of major social, scientific, economic, and political crises and alternatives can all be seen as part of one common evolutionary transition. She's lectured extensively in Europe, Japan, and the United States on how the integral framework provides a unifying understanding that can crystallize the shift from crumbling modern nation states to a more intelligent and sustainable global civilization. She has authored over 50 articles and five books. Less formally, Dr. Gorner is best thought of as a scientific missionary devoted to giving those already struggling with change in business, education, health, and community a solid foundation and a clear vision of how their fragment or reform fit within a larger picture of what we need to do to survive as a civilization. Dr. Gorner, thank you for being with me today. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to this. Before we get started, perhaps you can provide us with a little more detail about who you are and how you got interested in the subject of nonlinear dynamics, which is often referred to popularly as chaos or complexity theory. Well, okay. One does not plan to have the kind of career that I have. You sort of stumble upon it synchronistically. That's pretty much what happened. So I started out as an engineer. I did high-tech R&D for about 15 years. And then I went back to uh, grad school in psychology to follow what I thought was my true love and hit the brick wall of, boy, what they do for science and psychology is pretty horrifying. So I became very disillusioned. And instead of going into psychology, I ended up going off and finding yet another advanced degree. This time, what do we call it? Pretty much in nonlinear dynamic, but more generally called systems theory. But went back to a little place called the Saybrook Institute in San Francisco and had a dream team of a dissertation committee with, I had a theoretical physicist from MIT, a mathematician from UC Berkeley. I had a systems theory from Vienna and you know, and a psychologist from UC Berkeley was all quite exciting anyway. And at the same time, I ended up stumbling it across what I see as the new scientific revolution bubbling up in a little heretical circle in different places, particularly at that time in, in system science. But largely what happened was I found that there was this different way of doing science that would make psychology a science and, in fact, transform our understanding about pretty much all the different scientific disciplines, whether it's physics and math or anthropology and sociology or economics or education or everything. For the last 25 years, I've devoted my life to essentially trying to make that new scientific framework intelligible to the people who really need it, which are those people who are struggling in education or healthcare. Or... So I've done work in all of those fields now, and it's been an exciting and <laughs> eye-opening experience. Let me add a little addendum to that, that explanation of how I got into this. I was also a student of a mathematician named Ralph Abraham, who's one of the shining lights of nonlinear dynamics or chaos theory, especially in the early days. So he was being invited all over the world to give lectures to every kind of group imaginable. But he frequently would, at the last minute, not be able to go. So instead he would say, but I can't come, but you can have her. So I would go, you know, even as a student, I was given opportunities to talk in all these different places. And what was most amazing was that I'd be talking to, I don't know, economists, or I'd be talking to advertisers. That was one of my favorite ones, or educators. And in every one of those groups, they would see some of what was already happening in their field, the reforms that were slowly beginning to bubble up in their field. They could see how what I was talking about in the math and the physics and the way growth and development work was also playing out in, in the kinds of things that they were grappling with. So it became kind of an apprenticeship with um, how is great change, this process of societal transformation, taking place in every field and across the world. And it's all of a piece, which is fairly astounding. And the science can help it, but it's already happening even without the science. So a lot of what I try to do is help people realize that all of this change, whether you're struggling with, I don't know, it, why is austerity a good idea in economics, or what else do we do in order to make economies sustainably vibrant, which is my current area of work, but that also relates to education. How do we educate our kids in ways that really make them energized to go out there and be collaborative learning citizens that really care about each other and their work and and the society and make us adaptive for the kinds of crisis.
crisis that we're facing. It. It's astounding to me. All of the people all over the world in all of these different endeavors pretty much have invented all of the solutions we need. We just don't know how to bring them together into one whole piece. I actually had no idea you were a student of Ralph Abraham. I know you cited him in your work, but oh, I didn't yeah. know you were his student. So that's especially interesting because I think many people that are listening might know Ralph Abraham from his associations with, say, Terence McKenna and Rupert Sheldrake, who's famous for a series of oh, trialogues. Sure. And those are very interesting and largely metaphysical. So they're separate in ways from his work on chaos theory, his more mathematical, technical work. But he always weaves chaos theory into his metaphysics and his way of viewing the world. I know, and again. And frankly, logically so. <laughs> that is, once you get into chaos theory, all these kind of hard, fast boundaries that we place between spirituality and science, they really blur because you start realizing that there's order, order everywhere. That's the real meaning of chaos theory, despite the name. You realize that synchronicities and higher powers, and I can go into chapter and verse about how this new understanding of, it's not just the mathematics of chaos theory, it's really the combination of the way the forces that hold us together. That's really what chaos theory is about. It's about how those forces shape us and create patterns because we don't just zip off into space. We just come back around and there's this invisible pattern, strange attractors, if you will, that keep pulling us in these invisible ways. And when you add energy flow, which becomes self-organization theory, you get this very logical, scientific, but yet also incredibly spiritual understanding of, about how the world works. And it all makes perfect sense. You can see why what the great spiritual sages were talking about was exactly the way the real physical energy-based universe works. It's just that they were using words that we have a hard time connecting to the everyday world that we see around us. But I think we're more able to do that now that we understand that this is an order-producing universe. And <laughs> there really aren't very many real accidents. There's differences, diversity, and synchronicities, but it's all of this incredibly awesomely ordered system. I completely agree. As you just hinted at, you're not in love with the term chaos, and I believe you prefer to call the study of this phenomenon energy network science, or ENS for short. Well, that's what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm half psychologist, right? half engineer, half psychologist, all system scientist. But the psychologist in me is excruciatingly aware of how words can mislead. So and, and chaos theory is a perfect example of that. There's real science underneath this, under the term chaos theory. But what happened was once the term became popular, it got taken off into all these different directions. And eventually people, I heard, I've been at conferences, well, they'll, they'll say that chaos theory means that you should run your business organization to the place that it's falling apart because things happen past the edge of chaos. And I'm going, this is nuts. You know? It became, so the word became a projective test and it eventually lost meaning and actually the science got lost along with a lot of the popularity once people said there's no there there because, you know, you'd go to a conference, somebody was standing up there saying what chaos theory means to them, and it eventually became just a tower of Babel. It was, there was no there there. There was no meaning. And you can see the same thing happening with other terms. People are struggling to find a term that both encapsulates the positive direction that is in here that is possible, that I absolutely, completely believe we're heading in. So you have to capture that positive aspect of it while also grounding it in something that isn't going to run a, run amok. So that if you call it chaos theory, people are going to think it has something to do with chaos <laughs> in the vernacular sense. Whereas, in fact, it doesn't. It was a sort of a scientific joke. So people are experimenting with names, complexity theories suffers from a similar kind of phenomenon where, I mean, when you say complexity, people just think it's complicated, and then the scientists go off and confirm that by being very complicated and arcane and obtuse and hard to understand. So, I don't know. For me, energy network science is my latest incarnation of an attempt to use a name that kind of keeps it grounded, because these are, it's really about understanding, instead of understanding our world as separate little discrete atomistic bits. This is a matter of understanding our world as comprehensively connected energy flow network so that your body is a system whose existence 
arises from and depends upon the circulation of energy and information and nutrients and all of this kind of stuff circulating around. The origins of life grew up from chemical networks of circulating matter and energy. And you can go through detailed <laughs> findings, established findings on how you get from each of those stages of, of little circulating flow networks to the incredibly complicated flow networks that are both living organisms and societies. And they all follow similar patterns and they're just great advancements on each different stage of this kind of self-organizing energy flow network. Well, we're talking about self-organization then. So that term is self-evident in one way, but also subtle in another. So maybe can you better explain a little more what exactly that is? Because I think many people would counter that by saying, well, what is self-organization? All there is in the universe is random molecular motion. And eventually, when the right chemicals or the right atomic structures bounce into each other, then through serendipity, we get structure. But self-organization is different. So can you explain how it's different? Well, it's actually not completely different. This is definitely, I call this the scientific change, the new Copernican flip because it's the same old facts of physics and math and biology that you already know, but they're organized in, to form a completely different picture. So it's like an optical illusion. So my favorite one is the famous optical illusion with the that can be seen as either an old hag or a young girl. So, you know, if you're talking to somebody who, for instance, believes in the Darwinian selfish gene version of evolution, then you're talking about you know, a bunch of little facts. They see it as the nose of an old hag, but you see it as the chin of a young girl, right? Well, self-organization is an example of that. So how does any kind of organization come into being? Well, there's two basic factors. One is energy, which provides the motive force for things to move and, well, basically for things to move. And then the other part of it are the, the forces that connect us, the attractive repulsive forces that, like magnetism and gravity and even electro, uh, electromotive forces. These kinds of things are like little invisible wires that keep pulling us in or pushing us away, but they are binding ties very specifically. So what happens, the difference between a classical Newtonian vision of, or a classical vision of these separate randomly colliding particles is that all those randomly colliding particles are not really separate. They all have some kind of binding forces that are pulling them this way and that. That's why when certain kinds of uh, chemicals get near to each other, they bind, right? That's what the chemical reaction is. We're just understanding that those forces that bind us together and that give shape and create the organization that we're talking about are more, much more ubiquitous than simply the little chemical reactions happening. Even the, what you think of them as, as random events are actually part of their sort of orbit. They, each little particle is bound by some set of attractive and repulsive forces and is moving in some kind of direction. So when it, it collides with something else that's moving in its set of orbits, yes, it's somewhat accidental and, and each instance is stochastic, as they say in the science biz. But there's also, it's also part of a larger pattern of structures and orbits and patterns, so that it's not completely random either. So a lot of this, I, I like to talk about it, chaos theory, therefore, as, as snowflake science, because what happens is you get all of these universal patterns, you know, the shape of a tree branching out is the same as the, sh as the shape of your lungs branching out or your circulatory system with arteries and veins and things. So you have all these universal patterns, but each instance of those universal patterns are infinitely unique. So they are a result of apparently random, very diverse, each unique instant in, in time that creates that particular version of this particular universal pattern. So this notion of randomness versus order is, is a bit fuzzy. It becomes a combination of stochasticity and universal pattern. So universal and unique at the same time, apparently random, but highly ordered underneath. I don't know if that answered the question. but 
I think what chaos embodies to me or self-organization embodies to me is making note and taking stock of the interdependence of things and the feedback generated between the small and the large, the local and the global. And that each informs the other and that order comes from that interplay from a balance. And so on a, I guess, metaphorical level, I think of it as a dynamic balance where chaos is not really chaos because if it's chaos, all you have is random statistics. And if all you have is pure order, you have a dead rock. But somewhere in between is that what Stuart Kaufman calls that poise state. And we seem to be existing in that poise state where all the forces, there's almost this conspiracy of forces working together where the tension between them on a local scale gives rise to order on a global scale or the disharmony on a local scale gives rise to disharmony on a global scale and vice versa. So it's a strange, there's a quantum logical aspect to it where it's both at the same time, if that makes sense. It's wave and particle at the same time. Well, yes. I mean, uh, though the balance for me comes in sort of later. I, I think it may, might help to explain actual self-organization theory a little bit, because self-organization theory, though it doesn't talk about it, really adds the energy aspect to why organization emerges. And once you get a sense of how energy works, then a lot of the rest of it, how, why we evolve, why there are bifurcation points, and you know, why do you require balance, all of these kinds of things make much more sense. So the basic idea of Self-organization theory can be seen in boiling water, which is you take a pot, no heat underneath it, you just have relatively random collisions, all right? You add the heat, which creates this pressure, creates this pressured move, motive force, as they call it, and all of the little molecules inside the pan start moving faster and faster till they get to this point that they literally cannot go any faster in the pattern of random collision. Then you have a crisis point because you have this force pushing it to go faster, and you've essentially reached the physical limits of that particular pattern. What happens, and this is what self-organization is, is some naturally occurring diversity, some little, in this case, a little pocket of relatively hot molecules will form a little bubble, and it will begin to bubble upwards, and it will lose its heat up there, and it will rise to the top, lose its heat, fall back down, and pull up other molecules in its wake, and create this little circular motion. Well, that circular motion is organization. And it came into being by this combination of pressure to change and naturally occurring diversity that provides a new opening for a path that makes energy move faster. All right? And then what will happen is that process will happen again. So the circular motion will move faster and faster because the heat is still on and the pressure is still on. And it'll go faster and faster till it literally reaches the limits of that pattern of motion. Now some new little quirk of diversity will happen, and it will split into two circular rolls that connect each other together in a figure eight. And what happens here is that energy now moves faster and faster, okay? So that you will have, in fact, you see this process of repeating patterns of self-organization, which under pressure, systems grow bigger, reach their limits, bifurcate, change into a new pattern of organization that moves energy more rapidly, and this is actually measurably so. And at the same time, it also becomes more complex. So you can also see the same kind of, you know, the figure eight pattern that you saw in boiling water actually can all, is a mirror image of what happens with an embryo developing. So an embryo is sucking in, in resources and growing bigger, and it reaches a point where it the bonds holding it together get stretched to a breaking point, and it divides into two. You have, now have greater complexity. It will circulate energy faster. It will be able to do more things, and it will keep on doing it, two cells to four cells, to et cetera, et cetera. And it will begin to have increasing complexity, increasing specialization, and all because of the natural geometries of behavior. That's what that's what chaos theory really should be called, is the study of the ge- natural geometries of behavior. When you understand those kinds of things, chaos theory ceases to have anything to do with real chaos, and it really becomes much more about natural patterns and universal processes of growth and development, if that makes any sense. Oh, it definitely does. And I definitely see linkages between, say, chaos or ordered complexity and something like Bohmian mechanics, where he implies order upon order upon order. 
And right. what we perceive as a hierarchy is something of an illusion. And that, again, there's this feedback between levels. Each one informs the other. And that what we might interpret as, say, entropy or disarray is, in fact, just a different form of order that interacts with another level of order that is imperceptible to humans. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, my mentor in physics was at MIT, Michel Barger, and he, he studied quantum chaos, which is very Bohemian. <laughs> and essentially what you find out is that when you get down to those really base levels, it is, again, it's at strange attractors, and so all of this is highly ordered, but it's got this strange kind of order that, is flexible so that there are part, parts of, you know, the yin-yang system? Sure. How I always remember quantum chaos. That is, if you get down to these really deep levels, it is half relatively highly structured order, and relative, and the other half is highly flexible and still evolving kind of order. But at each point in, in each of those sides, you can see another yin-yang symbol where each point is itself divided into ordered, structured, and highly structured, and, and flexibly structured. And then each point within each of those sections goes down like a fractal would. It is very scalar. It has everything to do with what looks highly structured at one level. It's a combination of structure and still open-ended flexibility at another, and on and on and on downward. And so, indeed, the whole concept of entropy changes meaning dramatically. <laughs> it drives me kind of crazy because... Entropy has now become so associated with the term disorder, they assume that the fact that entropy always increases means that order always, uh, disorder always increases. And this is completely, quantum chaos would completely contradict that whole idea. It is, in fact, much more like what you say. All entropy really means is the loss of the ability to do work. When they were first uh, developing the ideas of, of energy and entropy, energy was defined as that which was, is conserved when work is done, and entropy is, called, uh, is defined as that which is lost when work is done. And in essence, entropy is the c capacity to do work, which every time you do work, a little bit of the energy that you use gets lost microscale dispersion. And as a consequence, you can't do as much work as you could before because, but that energy is still down there, and if you what if you could get down to that lower, that microscale level, you could do work and bring that energy back up and then you'd still be able to use it. So it's not has nothing to do with disorder, it just has to do with dispersion. Yeah, so entropy in fact there's some suggestion out of coming out of quantum chaos that uh entropy is actually a fractal, in which case the I mean the dispersion is a fractal, which means that it's not disordered at all, it's just dispersed differently than it was before. And doesn't this also imply, if that's the case, that the idea of reductionism, of trying to find the primordial thing, the deeper you dig, the more complex it's actually becoming. I think many physicists assume the smaller you get, the simpler it is, that all electrons are the same, all protons are the same, and that we can know these things to any degree of certainty that we'd like. But in fact, what we're finding is that the deeper you dig, the more uncertain everything is. You can't pin these things down. They might be so complex and so fractalized and so beyond our instruments that we can't even comprehend it. Is that a fair claim to make? Well, yes, and in fact, the reason I call this energy network science is because that helps explain why what you just talked about really is still coming from a reductionist point of view, which is you imagine that at the basis of everything are these little material bits, whereas in my view, that the basis of everything is energy, including matter. So matter is just a concentrated form of energy. It's kind of tight, tightly bound and semi-localized. <laughs> so getting down to lower and lower and lower and lower level doesn't necessarily get you to any simpler anything. It just gets you down to deeper and deeper structures of energy, most likely fractal structures of energy. <laughs> I don't know. It's such a fundamentally different way of looking at things that it becomes somewhat difficult to answer some questions because at the bottommost level, it's still all energy and Forces and flows is what the physicists call it. It's flows of energy and it's forces like gravity or strong and weak atomic forces that hold things together. It's all forces and flows. And the degree of complexity, I don't know if it's any greater or less at different levels. It's just different scales. 
<laughs> but I don't know if it's more or less complex. I, I think in a certain sense, the macro scales represent, you know, kind of like the Russian nested dolls of complexity. So there's incredible amounts of complexity in, in an atom, and then the atom is organized into complex groups called molecules, which is organized into complex groups called different kinds of matter. And so that each stage is built of, probably becomes more complex because it takes the complexity that was already at the lower stage and organizes it more complexly at a new stage. You know, I think the major conflict comes with Newtonianism and even quantum physics. There's still a preoccupation with particles. That's why it's called the standard model of particle physics. It, right. e even though, by and large, it's transitioned over to a field theoretical view of reality and that particles are just kind of vibrations in the fields, for all practical purposes, when scientists are doing their work, they still use the model of, of point particles in isolated systems, which is extremely right. abstracted to the point where I don't think it gives an accurate view of what reality is anymore. And chaos or energy network science or complexity theory. It accounts for the connectivity, for the interdependence, for the feedback, both positive and negative. Now, it's more difficult to model because it is inherently nonlinear, whereas Newtonianism and quantum, a lot of quantum physics is linear and makes it easier to model. I think that's what almost pushes a lot of science away from chaos theory is that intimidation factor and practicality factor. Oh, absolutely. I mean, in fact, fabulous article that I just learned about a number of years ago, written in 1948 by a mathematician called Warren Weaver. And this was when they were first beginning to study what became either complexity theory or chaos theory, whatever you want to call it. And this was to a report to the Rockefeller Foundation in 52 as well. He points out that science really has evolved. It started out on incredibly simple systems. So you have the effect of a huge sun on an itty-bitty planet. And the gravitational effects of the huge sun are so powerful that it makes it essentially single causality. The sun causes the planet's motion. That's what you call linear systems because it's not because they go in a line. It's because one cause pretty much determines everything. And that's what we call determinism. And that's what we call Newtonianism. And then towards the uh, 18, late 1800s, they came up with statistics, which went to the opposite extreme, which said that if you have a lot of relatively equal-sized bodies that are very weakly coupled, that there isn't, you know, the connections between them are very, very, very weak. The simple upshot is that science really has, it's just opening a new stage. There is, there's a difference between statistics and Newtonian mechanics or determinism. It's precisely because of modeling and because of our abilities. So, and it also has to do with the degree of tightness of coupling. So that things that are very loosely coupled, randomly colliding molecules, it's perfectly reasonable to uh, approach those with statistics. And things like, you know, planetary motion where you have a huge sun on an itty bitty planet, perfectly reasonable to do Newtonian mechanics. And what Weaver points out, however, is that most of the things that we care about, you know, economies and businesses and living organisms and ecosystems all belong to this mid-range type of phenomenon, which he called organized complexity, which I still think is what we should call it. Because it's not just that they're complicated, it's that they are exquisitely ordered and organized. And in fact, the reason they exist is because they're organized in such a way as to bring in the energy and, uh, and nutrients and information even that they need to continue their existence. And that they're designed to circulate that inside and build and maintain the capacities that they need to continue going. And you know, certainly living organisms are examples of that kind of organized complexity. But so too are economies and societies. And you can't approach that with determinism because there are no single causes that absolutely shape how people work or how living organisms work. There's a multiplicity of factors that, that are involved. Nevertheless, you can understand them because they end up following these universal patterns. So there's a continuum between the Newtonian approaches and the approaches that fit organized complexity and the approaches that fit disorganized complexity. And we're just now beginning to enter the realm where we can understand how organized complexity works and we can actually do things like measure it and predict it and understand it like we couldn't before. 
Now we're talking a little bit about biological organisms, so maybe we can discuss complex systems theory, what it can teach us about human evolution generally, and the evolution of human consciousness specifically. Do you have any thoughts mm -hmm. on that? Oh, well, I mean, what comes out of energy network science, self-organization theory, chaos theory, all these different facets or words for the same kind of science, is fundamentally a different understanding of how evolution works, that it works as forms of self-organization. And when you have an energy basis, an energy-driven understanding of how organization emerges and grows and develops and evolves, then things like information, for instance. For me, information is a completely natural part of self-organizing evolution because information is, in its primordial form, is a kind of a pattern energy trail. So that smell is a little chemical gradient and light is, is a photon. The fact that things that are information handling capacities co-evolve with our bodily organization is not surprising at all, especially when you get to the origins of life. So that when you think about what really differentiates living systems from non-living systems, it's that living systems, when you take away their energy source, they go off and they search out another one and they go find their food in order to keep on existing. And that's fundamentally an information processing and following type of activity. But it's easy to imagine how it could have happened kind of from a mechanical almost point of view, that is. So you're one of the early chemical self-organizations, which had managed to sort of keep its own shape for a while. And yet, suddenly your, your heat source, let's say, goes away. But your particular one type of, uh, of orga organization had just been hit by a photon of light. And it manages to knock you in a particular direction and you stumble across a new energy source. Well, that's basically a primordial interaction of light causing you to go to food. Over time, all those organisms that, or organizations, shall we say, that respond productively to these little bits of energy trails, the little energy nudges that form information, if you respond productively to information, then you're going to survive, whereas other organizations that don't do so will die, will cease to exist. So that the relationship between information and moving towards the things you need to survive becomes the fundamental selection device. <laughs> That's what's going to make you last more, much more so than competition or all these other things that may happen at a higher scale. At the root level of life, it's information and information processing that differentiates us from non-living organizations. And you can actually follow the process of the natural patterns of self-organization repeating over and over again to create a nice understanding of the co-evolution of mind-body kind of systems where in living organisms you start out with first you have a single cell, then you have, maybe you get multiple cells, but the bigger they get, the more out of touch they get, but they need to stay in sync in order to be a living organism. So they start sending little chemical messages back and forth, and that works fine for a while, so they stay in sync. But you get to a point where they literally are out of touch, and then they have a crisis. So either they stop growing, or they invent something like a nerve cell, which is what the giant flatworm did 500 million years ago. As multicellular organizations get bigger and bigger, same kind of crisis happens over again. They fall out of sync, they fall out of communication, they fall out of community, and so they have to develop more nerve cells, and eventually you get to the place where you have a tower of Babel of nerve cells running around, and you invent brain cells to find and coordinate the information that's circulating around this massively complex thing. Same kind of process of co-evolution of these kind of physical structures and mental structures happens with the evolution of the economics, social structures, and stages of consciousness. And you can just run down chapter and verse moving from Let's if, say if you use, I like John Kepser's Stations of Consciousness. I think it's a magical, mythic, and what's the last word? Mental. But those correspond to, so archaic is when we were in kind of little foraging hominid pods. Magical emerges when we form hunter-gatherer tribes where you've got a little bit more structure 
you may have a lead hunter and you may have, you know, different roles that people play. But you get bigger and bigger. Next, you get to agrarian villages, and that'll be the mythic stage of consciousness. And agricultural forms changes the forms of economics. There'll be increasing trade with other groups. They're much more complicated the social structures. And, of course, the stage of uh, consciousness will include myths that also serve to keep a group coherent and things like this. Speech becomes more complicated, obviously. You get bigger and bigger. In fact, they know that around 300 to 350 people, villages become so big that people no longer can keep in touch. So that money <laughs> and those symbolic tokens that circulate get bigger and bigger, and you, you will eventually invent hierarchies. I've written extensively about different anthropologists who discuss the different kinds of pressures that go went into forming the kind of command and control militaristic hierarchies that we have today. And I absolutely believe that we're now at the, reaching the limits of command and control hierarchies because the pace of change and the level of complexity is way too fast to have some guy on top figuring out how to do everything up and down the line. And so that a lot of what's happening now, from my point of view, is a result of we're entering that next stage where we need to do something better than a command and control, militaristic, self-serving, oligarchic kind of hierarchy. We need to have a fractal hier a hierarchy, or heterarchy as they call it, where you're still going to have rich, you're still going to have poor, and you're going to have authorities as worker bees, but what you need is for the authorities and the elites to be committed to the health of the whole, not just to their maximizing their own wealth or power or something like that. So power has to be a fiduciary responsibility and used to help coordinate, facilitate, make it's a large part to listen because the people who are going to know what to do next are not likely to be the ones on top. It's going to be people out there who've dedicated their lives to some particular aspect of this whole that needs to change and how to make it better and reliable research for what makes it better as opposed to just some kind of fantasy argument. So I see us as on the cusp of a major economic, structural, and consciousness shift. It's the end of both a 400-year and a 5,000-year cycle. But I think the stuff on the other side is going to be pretty amazingly wonderful. I completely agree. Before we jump into applying chaos theory and nonlinear dynamics to societal problems and whatnot, I really want to just touch on one more thing in the evolutionary question. So first, with chaos theory, it brings up the question of the primacy of DNA. Where did DNA come from? And I think it's arguable that it, it rose out of these, what are called these circular autopoetic systems. I think that's how you Absolutely. pronounce it. There's a number of people who've done excellent research on that. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. And even if it was a primordial soup scenario where lightning struck the water and <laughs> the first organism came about, well, how? Okay, the lightning provided the energy, but then how did that cycle? And then that gets into these network flows and this energy. How does energy flow in nature? And that is really at the heart of what you're talking about. Is how does nature move? And then through that movement, almost how does it entrain matter? So I would say, like you're saying, the movement is more important it drags the matter along almost, <laughs> or it creates the matter in the first place. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of hard to figure out good words for it. We, we don't have it, but uh, yes, you're doing a good job. <laughs> well, there's limitations to language, obviously. We're doing our best. I think something else this theory well, let me, does. Let me do, uh, say one thing. Um, sure. I'm trying to remember whether, I think it was Freeman Dyson who actually went into detail about how DNA emerged from an energy accident, the whole little cycle of, DNA, RNA, and, and ATP, which is the energy-carrying molecule of the body, which is what allows and it's energy, of course, again, that allows things to move and grow. That all those three are chemically similar and related and that when you get too much ATP, which is like a big energy buildup, you can eff effectively have a little energy explosion inside an, an organism that creates a relatively stable DNA that's also kind of like key in lock fits RNA, which fits ATP, so that it provides this way of, I always have this image of a clay tablet, you know, soft clay tablet, so the RNA and the, and the ATP can create pressure on the DNA that actually shapes it, and then the DNA will preserve the learning and the lessons that are going on in the system, and that's pretty much what he says probably happened and caused the origins of DNA and RNA. I 
I can't help but having the picture in my mind of the hologram because I guess I'm so influenced by Bohm. So we have this membrane or this film that, that we then project a flow of, you know, photons or flow of whatever onto the DNA, and then that becomes kind of a map of the process, but it's not the fundamental thing in and of itself. But I think that's a way to think about it. But anyway, also, I see this as having something in common with Stephen Jay Gould's ideas about periodic jumps in the evolutionary oh, yeah, record. Yeah, and again, that shows that chaos theory is definitely at play in these in these kind of jumps. So it's not to say that there's like some god in the gaps, but there is a process in those gaps that is not traditional neo-Darwinian theory. It has to be oh, complemented. I know. I mean, it's sort of sad because the neo-Darwinian theory is such a mechanistic view, and it is so shaped by elite beliefs that I think 50, 100 years from now, we're going to look back and find it incredible that we ever, people, respectable scientists ever believed this. Now, please be clear that I completely believe there is such a thing as evolution. I just don't think it works by selfish genes. And I think it's actually dangerous and deadly and damaging to our society that authorities are running around and saying things like, you know, just selfishness is all you need kind of thing. That's crazy and it's destructive and it's doing our society in. I would have thought that by now self-organization theory would have gotten rid of that kind of simplistic view of how evolution works by sheer accident and selfishness. No, <laughs> it's just not a good way to approach evolution. Yeah, I mean, people really do take for granted the cultural milieu that a theory thrives in. Even though neo-Darwinism is not exactly what Darwin himself thought. Darwin himself was even a Lamarckian in a way. Oh, absolutely. But Dar mean, Dar Darwin's original metaphor was the tangled web of life on the bank of an English stream. That's very much more in, in sync with what we now think about as pretty much co-evolution of life oh, yeah. through energy yeah. networks. But that's not what ended up happening because, you know, we were in the reductionistic, materialistic, mechanistic, militaristic frame of thinking. We're still in the command and control hierarchy era. Right. And even see like something like the Dawkins phenomenon. That came about again in a time of like Thatcherism, Reaganites, Reaganism, the Absolutely. the markets, you know, free the markets. What gets advertised in our culture through mainstream media and mainstream channels is you have to follow the funding most of the time. And a lot of times what gets funded you have to look at who's behind these structures and why ideas are being put on particular pedestals. And I find it funny that if I raise this issue, I'm like, you know, the science is actually reinforced by the culture. and What the aims of the culture are amplify whatever theory fits its needs the most. They almost say I'm being a conspiracy theorist or something. And they're like, do you really think it's in everyone's mind? I'm like, well, of course it is because we're subconscious creatures and these things are just there. There's no doubt in my mind that they're the most amplified message in our culture of the selfish oh, yeah. gene, the selfish individual, get yours, there is no meaning to life, that kind of thing. Yeah, there's a wonderful little book by a British biologist called Brian Goodwin, and I think it's called How the Leopard Changed His Body. I always get it confused with another book that's named similar name, but he talks about the origins of Darwinism and how it got shaped by the religious beliefs of the time as well. This kind of angry God, <laughs> and, and, and you know, it's very dire and survivalist and, and this kind of stuff. He has wonderful examples of how those two things, the aspects of the culture that were struggling for survival, that just got swept up into the whole concept of Darwinism. Yeah, so, and, and I think comes back to this, no one understands what feedback is. Or, you know, they do. They understand, you know, you put a microphone up to a speaker, you're going to get a big scratching sound. But that's about as far as a lot of people's knowledge of feedback goes. And there's feedback everywhere, and that includes between culture and information and ideas. And it's all very important, and you have to take a very wide view to get the whole picture. And I think that's often not done. And the last thing on your note on consciousness, I think a note that you made in your book, After the Clockwork Universe, you mentioned mm -hmm. that the prefrontal cortex being the most recent to develop is obviously the most immature, but it's also the most powerful in terms of how it can shape information and help us manipulate our world. So in an essence, we're still children with guns almost. Is that a fair analogy? Yeah, well, that's for sure. Hopefully, we're leaving our adolescence what we are, because obviously the prefrontal cortex got us out of the jungle and making tools and to the place we are now, but right now we're at the big, arrogant power phase. You know, we're strong enough to make tools that will kill 
us and every, everything else, but we're not adult enough to know how to use them yet. So I think that analogy is pretty on. <laughs> so, but I have no hope. Probably because, you know, we are smart, and there really are a lot of people out there in every walk of life, in every field of endeavor, who are reinventing their field, and they are all moving this invisible hand idea becomes much more real to me, having seen all of those people in all of those fields. So that we just need to figure out how to see ourselves all as part of the same process, because that's what's going to change things, I think. Well, that and right now, I'm spending a lot of time applying these ideas to finance, business, and economics, because that's where the pressure is. You see that these changes are taking place everywhere, and the environmentalists have made the greatest impact on our consciousness right now. But just having environmentally friendly economic businesses is not going to be enough. You actually have to have an understanding of how you make economies and businesses human friendly as well as environmentally friendly so that we have businesses that create healthy people and healthy societies and healthy communities as well as a healthy planet. And I think those ideas once you understand, again, how nature works and how nature builds healthy systems, then a lot of what you need to do in order to have a healthy economy starts becoming obvious. And it will confirm a lot of what people already know, for instance. You know, you need robust circulation. You now, things have to go from the top to the bottom and all points in between because we're all part of this kind of big, complex economic metabolism that different people play different roles. But it, all those roles are necessary, and if you starve out the little guys, that's especially the middle guys, your economy is going to collapse. So you need robust circulation that reaches all the levels. You're going to need to be reinvesting in your uh, capacities and in your all the things you need, whether it's roads, schools, and internet, and but also creating thinking citizens, and all these kinds of things that are so obvious, but we don't do them. You know, you can't allow the system to be built primarily on sucking wealth from the bottom to the top and from the productive to the ownership class because eventually you will undermine, you'll cut the roots out from underneath your tree and it'll collapse. So I think get these ideas, these common sense ideas about how you get societies and economies to become sustainably vibrant is what I tend to call it nowadays. Once we understand how it works and why it works and what the conditions are, I think it'll be relatively smooth sailing. So I actually do believe that right now, because our transition is so tied to this move from command and control, self-serving hierarchy, to heterarchies based on what they call subsidiarity, where decisions are made at the lowest level possible and there's a great deal of distributed intelligence and distributed empowerment, but there's also a commitment to the health of the whole by everybody's part, that one of the first things we have to do is get leaders on board that are committed to the health of the whole. Ralph Nader has a, has a couple of books out recently, which are both aimed in the same direction, which is, one is called Only the Super Rich Can Save Us. And I think that's actually relatively true. We need to organize the high-integrity, socially responsible, wealthy elite to push their muscle behind creating the society that we all want to live in because it's going to be better for them as well as for everybody else up and down the line. Because it's really only a few of the more crazy super rich that are destroying us. I think we could make this transition remarkably fast if we had the right mind and muscle behind it. I'm reminded of Victor Schauberger's famous quote, which was comprehend and copy nature. So you're suggesting almost yeah. a, a form of biomimicry where we see how does nature do its thing? Why is nature so efficient? How can you have all this diversity cooperating side by side? Go walk in the forest or, I don't know, watch a nature documentary on the jungle and look at all the nuance and the diversity that exists side by side and cooperates. And it's not always in a dog-eat-dog fashion. It's in a very oh. reciprocal, just way. And in that sense, it makes perfect sense that we would want our society to operate in the same way. Honestly, when people are provided for in a society, 99% of dysfunction, 99% of crime, all of it goes away. It's not magic. It's needs hierarchy. It's understanding how the needs hierarchy works. 
And yeah. I think chaos theory is the best way or a chaos approach. I use that word, but again, I mean, your interpretation of that word is the best way well, to organize again, a society. It's and, important, and yeah. It's important to add the energy part because chaos theory is not really about energy per se. Self-organization theory is about energy, but they don't make that clear so people don't know. So people mistake the idea of self-organization to it will just happen kind of thing. You know, spontaneously do it. and You don't have to worry about the conditions that will make it happen and happen in the right way. So there is something about the energy and the web of forces that are really it's those things that each of these different fields are actually talking about. Right. It, it's not like you're just going to have a free market and that's going to magically solve everything. Because I'm sure maybe some like free market person will be like, oh, well, it's self-organization. Just let it run free. Everything's going to be fine. Well, no. Because if the actors within that framework are still acting contradictory to how nature flows, well, then exactly. no, you're going to still have corruption. And again, it's taking one thing as literalists that are going too far on one little idea or they're misunderstanding the whole picture. And that's the issue. And it's an education issue as well. And I think yeah. you are a large... And it's a media yeah. issue. And it's a antitrust issue. So absolutely, yes. I guess besides collectively, I mean, how can we as individuals like apply these lessons to our day-to-day -day lives? Because I think people struggle in the society that we've built. Uh, we were talking about kind of how backwards it is, <laughs> and people can't help but be influenced by that, and negatively so. So how can people, I guess, on an individual level start now, either in their own lives or on a community level, and start kind of implementing these things? Well, let's see. First, everybody should start with the problem that most motivates them, energizes them. So it doesn't really matter which part of the piece of the puzzle you, you work on. It's that, that you are working on the puzzle. Second part of it is trying to think outside the box. I mean, that's kind of cliche, but it's absolutely necessary now. And then it helps when you're trying to think outside the box, start reading people who have been thinking outside the box. I mean, Lord knows I didn't invent almost any of this. I'm really more of a synthesizer. I integrate things pieces. So somebody else out there invented all of these ideas, came up with these things by, because of their dedicating their lives to some particular aspect of the puzzle. But you need to have other people that you can talk to about these kinds of things. So form a little heretical circle. Form a discussion group. You know, if you're in a particular field, if you're in education, or if you're in healthcare reform, find other people who are really taking change seriously and start talking to them. Because the other thing that will happen is when you form those little organizations, you'll get more power, and you'll feel more empowered yourself. So a lot of times people are afraid to say what they actually see and think because they get squashed in the current power structures. And the most important thing is not to, what is, there's a name for it, politics of resignation, where you just assume that nothing can ever change. And I know a lot of very intelligent people who feel that way. You know, we'll never, we'll never get rid of Citizens United because power structure is the way it is. We'll never change businesses so that they start being productive with all of the stakeholders in the business as opposed to just the, the shareholders. And most of them don't get help anyway. You look back at history and even just recent history where civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, there's been a whole, whole assortment of things that seemed impossible at the time that have all come to pass. And I think we're heading in the right direction. And this new change, which will kind of bring all the best of all of those previous changes together in, in one great both liberation and freedom and justice and fairness for all, I think that can come to pass. And a lot of it is and just believing that it is possible and that you just got to push forward and keep on finding others who are like mine. I don't know. I tend to be doing that in my own life. I get to a point where you say, I don't know if this will have a big impact. I don't know if this will change anything. But I have my strengths. I have my weaknesses. How can I use what I'm good at or what I like to do yeah. to add to a cause that I think is important? And if more people did that, I think the better we'd all be off. Now, at the same time, there there is a lot of activity going on. And people will be like, well, a lot of people are involved in politics and what have you. But a lot of what we call politics nowadays is kind of theater, first and foremost. And second, it draws false distinctions between people. It's bent more on separating people than uniting them. 
yes, diversity and differences are important, but the lesson I always take out of this kind of theoretical framework is cooperation, 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 and dynamism within that cooperation. What can we create together? And right. I'm always interested in that larger question. And so I think no matter what your political bent or perspective on wedge issues or whatever, I feel like those are all kind of an aside to this larger goal of we want the best for everybody. We want everyone to be able to pursue their life's passion. And sometimes that's going to contradict with what you think might be the best way to go about life or constructing society or whatever. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think a lot of people might say, well, this is kind of impossible, but at the same time, you've already pointed at a couple of historical precedents, but there's one that you really dig into in your book, After the Clockwork Universe, where you discuss the transition from the medieval age to the Renaissance. Well, I think to that's the, a, to the modern age, medieval. Modern sure. Age. And I think that's an interesting story to tell. So maybe you can summarize, you know, what was going on at that time and how it parallels our own time. Do you use self-organization theory? You see these curve cycles, you know, starts out slow, builds up, reaches a limit and kind of curves back down. And then if you're lucky, new change will bubble up and go to the next level. And what I did in after the clockwork universe was actually talk about kind of a combined a historical understanding of those kinds of cycles from a British historian named James Burke. And let's see, now keep to self-organization theory and understanding how these cycles naturally occur. If you do that, you get this understanding of what they call great change, which is not just a period of, of changing the economy or politics, but everything changing at the same time. So the shift from medieval to modern included the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Scientific Revolution, and the Enlightenment. And at the end of that, then this is what, what's really interesting. There's a shift in the society's root metaphor, the root idea that the society organizes all aspects of itself around. So the medieval root metaphor was God's design, the hidden organizing master plan that lay underneath all things. And after the collapse of Rome, the missionaries going forth into the barbarian regions that began to form this metaphor and make it into real life. And so they organized, it wasn't just the churches, but feudalism was largely organized all around this hidden organizing master plan. And so you could continue plugging through this brutal existence because you believe deep down you were still trying to build God's city on earth. Works out when you have one of that kind of noble, inspiring root metaphors, large numbers of people from all walks of life are willing to dedicate their lives to this kind of thing because it gives them hope. And it all comes together and coalesces into a new form of organization to the extent that it's doing things better, it grows and develops. But eventually, if you have too much concentration and corruption, the elite of the group will start influencing the meaning and of that group metaphor and change it and distort it so that it becomes something that it wasn't originally intended to be. So eventually, the God's design became rational of, rationalizations for, I don't know, the Spanish Inquisition and the burning heretics and Reformation Wars, and but also selling indulgences and all sorts of other things. So eventually, once the golden root metaphor and higher cause, the spiritual spur that this new form of side organization organized itself around, once it becomes corrupt, things start falling apart, and slowly more and more people become disillusioned and there's this subtle pressure that begins to grow to change to something better. But in the beginning, people have no idea what would be better. Okay? So what the transition with the, with the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Scientific Revolution, and the Enlightenment was the development of that better way. Well, in this case, the better way was a clockwork universe, a universe that could, uh, could be understood by reason and through normal people. You didn't have to go through corrupt authority to find out how the planets worked or how farming worked best or whatever it was that you were interested in. And they spent 150, 200 years beginning to develop this new root metaphor of the clockwork universe that could be understood by reason. And we built a whole new civilization around this, only it too has now become increasingly corrupt. And so now you no longer have this warm, fuzzy feeling about a universe that can be understood by reason. You have this kind of vision of cogs in a machine and 
factory model schools and randomness and purposelessness and, you know, all sorts of very negative things that are a result of this view of a knowable and influenceable universe is now gone with the wind and we're, we have our own version of corrupt authorities and we're having our own breaking apart and bond fraying and we have ubiquitous pressure happening again and people are in their own way looking for better ways and they're inventing them. So we're now at the cusp of another great change, which is very analogous to the change from the medieval to the modern. This time, I believe it's modern to integral. And by the way, that's not Ken Wilber's version of integral. This was from anthropologist Jean Gebster. But anyway, integral society will be based about around the root metaphor of a system or an ecosystem or a web or a network. It's when you start realizing that everything is connected and that we can understand this connection and this connection will help us, again, understand the biomimicry. That is, we're in this world together and to, together we survive and prosper. And it's understanding how to work together and that will allow us to move beyond the limitations of the current now corrupt modernist mechanism system into undreamt of new type of transformation. And this transformation is already taking place in education and healthcare and urban planning and energy and industry and pretty much everything you can think of, science and spirituality. And I think it's a pretty exciting time to be alive as long as we don't get too bogged down in the fear of the all too possible ending up of snowballing crises moving down towards collapse. We just need to realize that that's not necessary. That's only if we can't get the, the elites driving us into the ground to let loose long enough to realize that it's in their best interest, too, to move up to the next level. Yeah, and I've definitely come to the conclusion that there's no shortage of solutions. It really is a matter of will, and that's kind of a cliche. But beyond will, it's also a matter of education and people knowing these things and really comprehending this worldview in the same way that people from the medieval ages eventually fully comprehended that worldview and, and were pulled along with that movement, that information movement, I guess you could say. Right. And I think people can act locally to achieve global order. I think in accordance with those theories with organized complexity and the principles of that, if you act locally, if you get your community together, that will create local effects, which ultimately will have a non-local character to them if allowed to evolve. So people setting up their alternative currencies in their communities, people setting up food distribution systems, local farming, employee-owned cooperatives, all kinds of things people can do. And this is, can help buffer against those larger, almost parasitic entities like a Walmart or whatever that tends to take wealth and value from community rather than sharing it and distributing it. So there has to be a new cooperative structure or new cooperative model on the small scale and only then can we get global order i think trying to force the super rich to do anything trying to force politicians who are no longer independent is yes you can do it on a local scale but i don't think you know the senate and congress i, I don't know if they're savable anymore <laughs> so i encourage people really to focus on what's right in their own backyard and what can you do to make business thrive, to make people thrive, to make your community thrive, and then the rest will follow. Well, okay, uh, two things. One is, you don't, you shouldn't be quite so grim about elites. Not all elites are greedy, self-serving bastards. <laughs> it turns out that there's just as many, well, I don't know how many, I don't know what the proportions are, but there are many people inside finance, what I'm working most with now, that are watching the disintegration of integrity among their fellows with horror and wondering what to do about it. Those people, you don't need to force them. You just need to empower them to go where they already want to go, which is restore integrity to their system. I just had an interview with a British guy with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation on Sunday talking about similar kinds of things, only in this case, both political and financial elites are going, oh my God, these other guys are setting us up for collapse again. And this is a bad thing because you can't just keep on collapsing and expecting the public not to come out after you with pitchforks and, you know, fire torches. <laughs> so there is a healthy percentage of the elite class who already knows that they need to change. They're looking for the proper way, way to change as well. And this is where the second 
point comes in, which is that getting this next stage of systemic, connected, web-like civilizations to work, integral civilizations to work, is going to take some substance. It's not just all heart and good intention. So that I spend a lot of time looking at researchers who have studied, like, how do you get people to work together? Because most communes and cooperatives fail because people don't really know how to make things work right. turns out that the answer is reciprocity, so that it's not enough to give and it's not enough to take. You have to have a fairly good balance of giving and taking because when you give, for instance, when you allow, this is the philosophy of time banking, when you allow somebody who's been basically discarded by society, elderly, sick, poor, uneducated, various types of ways that we throw away certain segments of the population, when you give those people a chance to contribute, suddenly it raises their self-esteem. It empowers them. It transforms them, literally. Not just having being on the receiving end of charity makes a huge difference. So that both the right and the left need to come to a better understanding that it's at core, it's not just spending money to help the downtrodden or making sure that you get all of uh, all of your stuff met. It's a combination of contributing, giving and receiving, reciprocity. That's the only thing that allows people to work and live together with equal balances of respect and contribution. So there are things to know about how to work together, how to be cooperative, that I think need to be more widely disseminated. And I'm hoping things like your efforts here are going to be part of that. So I see you as playing a very vital role in disseminating and clarifying the kinds of ideas that need to get out there because it is complicated stuff. It's tricky. Otherwise, we would have figured it all out by now. (laughs) Right, right. Okay, so we've been talking for a little while now. Before we wrap up, can you alert us to any new projects you're presently working on or just any parting words you'd like to leave us with? Well, I have come to the conclusion that the best leverage is going to come through economics and finance. And that's where I'm doing all of my work now. So I'm working with a group called the Capital Institute, and they're very interested in how do you reform finance so that the banking system, for instance, actually gets back to making commercial loans to the people who need it, which is largely at the small and middle scale. Also working with a group that does international development, because that's the other part of this. I mean, right now we still believe that growth in GDP, which is just the volume of money, not where it goes. Somehow that GDP growth will magically make economies better, better, but in fact, you could have a GDP going up and number of jobs going down. (laughs) So what we've got is a system that needs to be redirected towards developing human networks and healthy human networks in particular. That's what the international development people try to do, but they're kind of hamstrung by both the measurement systems because their funders want to know that they're doing something right, so they have these various metrics. But to the extent that we can provide them with better metrics and just and sort of free them from these kinds of notions that increasing efficiency, for instance, always makes things better, where in fact increasing efficiency frequently makes things worse because it tends to eliminate diversity and tends to eliminate billions. So working on getting these ideas in a concrete and practical way down to international development and finance and economics. That's what I'm doing these days. It's kind of exciting. Well, Dr. Gorner, I, I wish you all the best with that. I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of that work, and I'd like to thank you again for making some time for me today. It's been a really fruitful conversation, I think. I think people will get a lot out of it. I've enjoyed it immensely. Thank you so much. <laughs>